I'm Anastasia Duval and I'm Director of Family and Education at a think tank called Civitas um, and I'm also a trained primary school teacher and I specialised in inner city teacher training and one of the things I've been very interested in is in how teachers respond to, to their pupils and to their students when they get older um, and what is enabling or disabling that in schools at the moment. And because of that interest, I'm particularly interested in class size and, and also particularly interested in the beginning of school because that's when pupils engage with learning or don't engage with learning. So to start on this idea of class size, particularly in infant school, and how this affects how good teachers are able to be, essentially. One of the big issues that we have in this country is that we do have very large infant classes. Now, all the evidence suggests, or doesn't suggest, is conclusively saying that class size for very young learners is very important. Why that is, is because it means that the teacher is able to interact specifically with the children in front of them and specifically with those children's needs. Now, this is very important for every child, but it's particularly important for children with special educational needs. And one of the things I would say is that every child has special educational needs and the teacher needs to be able to spend direct one-on-one -on -one time with them within a classroom rather than within an exceptional situation in order to find out what those are. This also connects to how well teachers are able to respond to pupils later and also how well they're able to respond to pupils in relation to their parents. And something which is also very important is a relationship being built between pupil and parent. And again, this comes down to size, partly class size, so that the teacher is able to spend time interacting with the, the pupil's parents because there aren't too many of them, but also school size. One thing that we found in this country is that very large comprehensive schools, for example, so for older kids, can be very difficult in terms of the parents not knowing who the teachers are, the teachers not knowing the parents, and also for a lack of community generally, which is very difficult in terms of particularly behaviour, but also in terms of if students are struggling. The head may not be familiar with the pupils, the parent doesn't know who to turn to. There's a lot of transience often in, in large schools. It's very difficult to keep a relationship going um, if, if there is a constant teacher turnover. And, and that's something actually which is very symptomatic at the moment of our education system is generally throughout primary school and also secondary school. There is a very high teacher turnover which is terribly difficult in terms of building relationships between pupils and, and their teachers. Specifically on special educational needs, I think one thing, going back to this idea of, of teachers being able to respond to their pupils, is being able to identify what the particular learning needs of a child are. And we have seen recently the latest figures on SEN figures, um, SEN numbers in schools, showed that there has been a significant rise over the last five years in particular in terms of the numbers of pupils with SEN. This in many ways is a positive because we are identifying the fact that pupils do have additional needs. On the other hand, it could be symptomatic of a structural problem, and that is that children are having to be categorised as having special needs, where in fact it may be because they aren't being identified in a more mainstream way, which may be because these identification processes, as it were, are being thwarted by teachers having to effectively crowd control and also by teachers having to treat children in a very standardised way. So in that respect, it could be a negative. But it's certainly very significant that the number of children um, who have or who are seen to have special educational needs has gone up. Because what does that mean? How are teachers going to be able to respond to that? And this goes back probably to the final, but one of the most significant points, and that is in order for teachers to be responsive to their pupils, it's not just about them being able to interact with them, so it's not just about a numbers game, it's also about how much autonomy teachers have. And to have autonomy, teachers need to be able to... Um, design much more of what they teach than they do at the moment, which means much less central prescription. And in order for us to feel confident about that, in order for government, in order for policymakers, in order for the public purse to feel that this is a prudent move, we do need to make sure that we have excellent teachers who are professionals, who are able to exercise this sort of autonomy. And that may lead to a whole new topic, which is do we need to raise the bar for teachers? One of the reasons that we have perhaps 
what many see as a low status for teachers in this country is because it isn't as difficult to get into as it is in many other countries. So Finland is often given as an example. It has a very good education system. It does fantastically well in international studies. And every teacher needs to have a master's. Now, this government is in a way moving towards that, saying that we're going to be certifying teachers, having ongoing checks during their teaching career, and also trying to encourage more teachers to do MAs. But actually, it's really about before they start teaching. It's who goes into teaching and what level they are, rather than whilst they're on the job, because by then, in many ways, it's too late to learn.